Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we do have a few seats up here in the front. Some of them are, say reserved on them. We're not sure if the reserved people are going to find them or not. So if you can't find a seat, look around up here in these front rows. Uh, so being up here on the stage, uh, looking out at, at everyone, it's like you realize how big this theater is. <laughs> and it, it also kind of reminds me what a really great community we have here in Tucson. So it's, it's a community that supports art, it supports science, and in this case, it supports the wonderful world of insects. So, and it, this might just be my opinion, but I think the loft cinema is sort of right in the center of that community, and I really appreciate them. So my name is Cody Sheehy. I'm the producer of Insecta. Um, I work for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Arizona. And the college really is a major uh, funder and supporter of Insecta, and I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate our, our dean, Shane Burgess. I think he's here tonight. Um, he's in, oh, he's in the lobby. Oh, oh. maybe I started too soon. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, Insecta was originally his idea, and I think it reflects, you know, his, his vision, which is one of the reasons why Cal's is, is becoming one of the most sought-after places to work. And it's very cool. Um, <laughs> so, so usually when the producer's up on stage, they're kind of soaking in all the credit and getting all the glory. But what I want to do today is direct the lion's share of that to someone named Kara Gibson, who's sitting right here. <laughs> She's been a leader throughout this entire project. She's done a tremendous amount of work in the production, in all, all aspects of the production and the promotion. And uh, without her, this film would not have happened. So um, hopefully we can give her a huge round of applause. <clears throat> I also need to thank uh, Dr. Mike Stanton, Dr. Uh, Bruce Tabashnik, Dominic Rodriguez, Jennifer Yamnitz, and the Voorhees Science Communication Endowment. And we also received uh, generous support from Ag Motion and the Sci Art Center. So that has been really great. So as you all know, it's, it's financial support like that that makes you know, fil little films like this possible and, and projects like this possible. Um, and also it's important, I think, that I point out that you know, my boss, Dave Bogner, is behind the scenes here making all this event tonight happen. And uh, he's a real expert, and I've learned a lot from him. Um, also, my wife is here, and she's my biggest supporter. And uh, without that kind of support, these projects also wouldn't happen. So thank you both for that. So the program tonight is pretty simple. Um, we're going to be watching the documentary uh, directly. Um, then after that's done, it's going to go for about a half an hour. And then after that's done, um, I'll get up and say a few things about the filmmaking process. And then the scientists will come up here, and they'll get a chance to talk and then when they're finished, then we'll open up the floor to questions. And I really want to encourage everyone to think of a good question because we're here to have a conversation with you, and um, this is what this whole thing is about. So while you're watching the film, while you're listening to the scientists, please uh, don't be shy. We want to, to hear what you have to say. So with that, I'll just say thank you for coming. Um, I sincerely hope you enjoy your evening tonight, and uh, let's run the film. <clears throat>
just fed her so she's kind of fat and sassy. She had a nice big juicy caterpillar off the cabbage plant. She was very happy with that. This is that bait I was telling you about that these collectors have been using. So they were they were they were successful in getting a black witch moth. It's really cool. I think hey guys, do you still have the moth? Can you would you mind showing it? and I would spend a lot of time outside just kind of poking around and finding things. And what I loved about the natural world is I loved to see things rot. Something about insects, it, it kind of approaches that place in us that, that is, is the same fascination that we have in circuses for things like a bearded lady. They're just sort of like outside of our day-to-day -day experience. And, and so I think that, that you know, mortality is sort of got this strange beauty and this kind of dark draw for us. If you've ever spent any time digging around in compost, you'll know that there are some really incredible creatures in there, some that um, look like really large, kind of nasty things. Like there's a part in The Wrath of Khan where they drop a, a bug into the guy's ear and it's supposed to go in and eat his brain. And, and uh, there's a lot of things in your compost that look just like that. And even without ever seeing that, that clip in film, you still have that sense of like, whoa, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we'll see a lot of that? Yeah. Okay, you want it like everybody else is feeling? Yeah. Sure. I recognized in myself, if I were going to be a really successful bench scientist in the current way that academia works, I would really need to be devoting my whole self to that. And I have a family, and I wanted to make sure I had time also to be a mother, and uh, so I've sort of retooled a little bit, and now I spend more time teaching and doing outreach and engagement. Did you get it? Yeah. Wow, you actually did. Actually got a wash bun. Nice catch. Ever since I was a little kid, I'd be wandering around in, in the fall or the summer, and I was just always intrigued by the insects, the small things. I was little. And some people are intrigued by you know, seeing uh, a football or a basketball, or some people are intrigued by you know, getting a paintbrush. I was intrigued by the beautiful wasps and the bees. I, I don't really you know, look forward to getting stuff. It's just kind of one of the, uh, the hazards of my chosen you know, activities in life, you know, trying to answer questions about stinging insects. And, you know, I've been stung, like I said, probably 500 or 1,000 times by honeybees. So I said, well, we've got to get some numbers. We've got to rate that out, which is less than that out, which is less than that out. So how do we do that? Well, we come up with a pain scale. work on, on the higher levels of the genus, which is kind of like the cluster of species that are all very similar. So the number I usually go by is in, in the book, The Sting of the Wild, where I made a table of these, and an appendix in the back, I have 83 listed. Ten fire ant stings hurt me about as much as one honeybee sting. So you can, you can continue that, that extrapolation. Ten honeybee sting will hurt about as much as one good Maricopa harvest ant. That's the red harvest ants we see running around on the sidewalks here in, in Tucson and, and the southwest. You got ten of those, ten of the harvest ants would be about equivalent to one bullet ant or one tarantula hawk. So that's pretty much the relationship. There fortunately aren't any fives. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I love animals. I don't care if they're scaly, scary, hairy, toothy, or absolutely huge. Look at that swamp beast. Guys, do be aware that if I do immediately go into a state of paralysis, just... They've got a sting that's about six 
seven millimeters, about a quarter of an inch long, a third of an inch. They'll get you. Electrify is one word. And you can imagine that. That's about what it feels like. It's instantaneous. It's electrifying. It's clean. It's sharp. It's very pure. It just totally shuts you down. It's like short-circuiting your brain. And your brain is sort of idling along, and you think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm still functioning. Well, wrong. So I tell people, if you get stung, don't try to be tough and all that. Just lay down. Lay down and scream. All right, Coyote. You okay, man? Your heart racing? A million miles a second. This is the most nervous I've ever been to take a sting or bite from anything. My hand is shaking. Are you guys all ready? Oh, yeah. I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the tarantula hawk. Let's go for it. One. like I have lung power, I can scream for about two or three minutes. By the time you finally run out of energy for screaming, you kind of, oh, it, 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 it doesn't hurt anymore. And you can see the stinger where it went in right there. I think there. we have this, this arms race, predator prey. We're, we're the predator, insects are the prey. And so I think what happened is they won. We're dreadfully afraid of them, the bees and stinging ants and wasps won that war because they, they get into our head. For instance, a lot of people are afraid of shark attacks. But, you know, I recently saw a statistic that actually humans bite more humans on the New York City subway than sharks bite humans. And so, similarly, mosquitoes are an incredible problem because they transmit malaria. They're fa they can be fatal because of what they're carrying. And so, yeah, I think sometimes the our sensation, our fear doesn't necessarily map to where the actual risk occurs. We're all here together. This is like one planet, and we've had a lot of time here on this planet together, interacting with one another in these nuanced ways that science is just starting to uncover. It's one of the most exciting times in biology, but I'm sure that every biologist throughout time has said that. So, When we think about the history of uh, humans, understanding the world around them and pursuing science, one of the very first steps was for these explorations of the world, major collecting expeditions, where Charles Darwin and uh, Wallace would travel, collect specimens, bring them back. I think of it as a map creating a map of the biological world. We still do that type of research, um, and we're still learning a lot. We're learning, we're discovering new species. I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I pursued marine biology for my master's degree. I studied marine isopods that live in the South Pacific Islands, and we would, for collecting, I would uh, put on my old scuba gear and dive, go diving, and it was a really fantastic and fun experience. open-hearted people I had ever met. We were, we were in love, and we, we decided to get married. And <laughs> it was a lot, a lot of big decisions all at one time. 
needed to make a shift so that there wouldn't be such an overlap between my professional and personal uh, lives. And so I decided to switch to entomology to study basically the crustaceans of the land. I specialize on bombardier beetles. Bombardier beetles are special to carabids. They are these masters of chemistry. They mix chemicals inside of their bodies in a way that creates an exothermic reaction just before it leaves the body of the beetle. My collaborators and I have a, a grant through the National Science Foundation where we're able to look at um, the, the genes involved in the production of defensive chemicals for these bombardier beetles. They'll, they'll blast you when you collect them. And uh, it doesn't hurt too bad. It's not as hot as Burkinus, the other lineage of bombardier. It's not the boiling point of water, but it's definitely a bit of a shock. You would have turned around and driven away. Yeah, you know, there was a plan. Yeah. Sure. And then you fell. Yeah. My personal mission um, tonight is to try to get more of those new species, the small bodied ones, but also to get as many of the larger Gonitropus kunsni as possible. Beyond this point, so we're going to be in new territory. But once you've seen a few of them, you get, get an eye for it, and then just out of the corner of your eye, you'll see a black something moving at just the right speed, and it'll catch your attention, and you turn, and it usually be just out of reach. <laughs> I used to work on marine crustaceans, and insects are basically just flying crustaceans. So. But the most exciting thing I ever did was hook up with Wendy on a Polynesia expedition to uh, Tahiti and Guam and Fiji, and that was the beginning of Wendy and I. <laughs> Today we're looking at a malaise trap sample, and that is um, a kind of a flight intercept trap. So this is a really convenient way to trap a lot of insects. I think what's extraordinary about looking through a malaise trap sample is that there's so many different shapes and colors and textures. I think the other thing about insects that's amazing is that they've been here for a lot longer and they they dominate Earth. They're in pretty much every habitat except for like benthic in the sea. Being in all of these different habitats and occupying all these different niches is what has allowed them to modify all these different structures to fit those spaces. And so that's part of it too, is that the story is kind of writ in the body. Flies generally have um, piercing slash sucking mouth parts. They look like puppies. They've got these beautiful little brown, wide-spaced eyes. Wow, that is a really crazy mouth, too. Whoa, this one has a crazy abdomen. So insects have an open circulatory system, so their air comes right directly into their body at different points along the whole length of their bodies. And so the spiracles are sort of equivalent to our nostrils. And it's just sort of odd to think about a nostril on your abdomen. University of Toronto, and um, Toronto is considered one of the most multicultural cities in the world by the United Nations. 
and I would do this in a little room by myself for several hours, and then I would go outside of the museum where I worked and walk on the sidewalk and think, this is not diverse. I mean, I guess, like, the standard setup of people, I'm over it. Is that weird? Like, there's just, like, a limited number of, like, types and shapes and insect world. When we just look at the insects, that's 52% of described species. They are related to us on the planet, so, so we're more closely related to insects than we are to, say, plants, and, uh, or microbes, uh, or fungi. These are the major groups of life on our planet. The reason why beetles are so successful, one of the reasons why, is they've developed um, a hard uh, protective shell that's called the elytra. It's actually the front wings, but they protect the hind wings, which are the flight wings. So structural differences are one reason why things can be so successful. Everything's kind of adapted to where, they're, where they occur. Things, you know, die out that can't adapt, and speciation events takes place. So everything's constantly evolving and changing over time. Those that survive the changes are the ones that are successful. The field of systematics involves naming species, determining how they're related to one another, and then establishing classification systems, which, it, which are a nested set of organisms based on their relatedness. Together, that shows us a map of how organisms evolved throughout the history of life on Earth. What we have here in this collection is the product of all of that time. Our goal is to take these specimens and to keep them forever for all future generations to study. For me, like, it just fills me up. Like, it's so obvious, you know, that that is such a good thing to do. You definitely always need physical specimens because you can only do so much with an image, an image you can't analyze for molecular analysis. So the specimens in the collection are irreplaceable. If a specimen was lost or damaged, you can't go back to Mount Lemmon in 1942 and recollect that specimen. When those specimens were collected, the collectors and the people who have curated them all of these years had no idea what kind of sequencing technology was going to come down the line. It used to be that we would need to go collect specimens specifically for molecular phylogenetic analyses. Recent advances in sequencing technology allows us to sequence small pieces of DNA that are very fragmented. Museum collections are filled with specimens that have fractionated DNA that we could not use for genetic projects in the past, but now they're perfectly suited for this new sequencing technology. And there are going to be a lot of other technologies in the future that we can bring to bear on these time capsules. Natural history collections are time machines. Getting mic'd up. This is like a double mic situation. Action. All right, guys, it's a big day on location here in Tucson, Arizona, because I am about to meet the king of sting himself, the godfather of the insect sting pain index, Justin Schmidt. We are right outside of his house. If you guys are ready, let's go inside with the man himself, Justin Schmidt. I'm expecting bullet ants. Oh, oh there he is. I see you've got some of our favorites over here, tarantula hawks. Yeah, we've got a couple of Beautiful. tarantula hawks, celebrities. You're just going to open that up, huh? 
Well, sure, you can see better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, yeah, everybody at home watching is probably like, wait a minute, you just took the lid off of the tarantula hawk terrarium. See there? Oh, you're just going to put your hand in there. I don't think so. No. But you see, what I'm doing is just demonstrating that mm -hmm. they really aren't out to get me. I mean, if they were out to get me, I'd be stung. Right. Now, if I put my thumb on the back mm -hmm. of them, I'm going to get nailed. Yeah, but applying pressure is all a part and of it. I don't want you getting out because then I have to catch you. Yeah. That's I'll kind of lead us in, and then yeah. I'll ask you some questions. You can tell me some stories. I'll give you some of my experiences. And, and then, of course, when we're talking about experiences, I think what people really want to know are probably, like, our, our top three. <laughs> Four cut. Excellent. Let's, Let's talk go stings. for it. For me, the tarantula hawk almost put a line in the sand, <laughs> no pun intended, when it came to completing the sting index because I will never forget what it was like. First of all, how intimidating that creature is to, to get that thing in the entomology forceps, and it looks like and an alien. Strong. It is strong. The wings are going, and you see that quarter-inch stinger coming in and out of that abdomen. And that moment where I'm like, all right. And it's sharp. I'm going to have to place this on my forearm and take this sting. And when I finally worked up the courage to do that, you know, I do this countdown where it's three, two, one, or one, two, Bingo. three, and boom, you place it down. The sting from that insect was electric in nature. I've, I've been shocked before by accidentally, like, you know, taking a zap from, a, like, an oh, yeah. electrical all, cord, right? This was that times ten, and it put me on the ground. My arm seized up from muscle contraction because your mind goes into this state that's just – it's blank emptiness, and all you can focus on is the fact that there's pain. radiating pain coming out of your and that's arm. why you scream, because now you're focusing on something else. Yeah. Yesterday, I woke up at 3 a.m., went to bed at 9.30, and then I got up at 4. Explaining science to other members, that are, and they're so empowered, and it's really great. distinguishing characteristic of us versus most other things. We have this insatiable curiosity. I think we, we need to feed that. We feed that through music and art and dance and, and language and poetry. But we feed it through exploring. And science is one of the fields that we explore. Once you realize how completely spectacular the natural world is, you are very driven to protect it. The sheer beauty that that's, you know, what elevates the human spirit, that's what, that's what makes us special. And if we aren't special, what are we? We're nothing.
So I'm going to say a little bit about the film um, while they're setting up some chairs here for the scientists. Um, first off, just being a filmmaker, it's really great to see something on the big silver screen like that. It's really awesome. And another thing I really appreciate about filmmaking is, you know, I don't think there's a lot of jobs out there that when a project is done, you really get a, a great, satisfying um, night like this. So I really appreciate everyone being here to, to make it like that. Um, when we set out to make Insecta, we had the goal of raising awareness and appreciation of insects. And from the scientists, you're going to hear about why that's so critically important. Um, but for a filmmaker, that really put me in a tough spot because people really don't like insects usually. I mean, they t could even be you know, repulsed by insects. There's a deep, uh, deep-seated fear that we have. So what we tried to do with the film was really meet people right where they're at with, that, with those stereotypes, that insects are scary, that they sting, uh, that, that people who study them might be a little bit odd. You know, who would want to study insects? So we try to meet them there and then uh, take the audience on this journey away from that and towards the, the wonder and the excitement of science and exploration. And I'll leave it to you to, to judge whether or not we were able to do that. Um, but that was what we attempted to do. And uh, the, you guys, the scientists, can you come up here now? We're ready for you. So. If you guys want to just go ahead and take a seat for a moment. Um, before we get started, um, I want to give uh, Kara a special gift here. Um, it's, uh, it's what I said earlier about what this film is really would not have been possible without you. So I really appreciate that. And I want everyone to know that a lot of what you saw on the screen were her ideas. And so I just was kind of a tool to implement a lot of what she was trying to do. And so I think through this process, I've never seen anyone work so hard. And you deserve a new title for your resume, which is the most outstanding co-producer you could ever have. <laughs> so this is what they call a clapper board. And I hope that it symbolizes your new, your new title. <laughs> So I ordered one from China that didn't arrive. And so I had to make this one last minute today. But I'll give you the real one when it, when it comes. And uh, it also symbolizes um, to me how much I appreciate the amount of work you did. Because no one will ever know, except for me, how much she did. And it's incredible. So thank you for that. Very cool. um, now at this point in the program, it's the part that you guys probably really came here to see. And that's to... Uh, get a chance to listen to some real experts in the field. Um, it goes way beyond uh, documentary filmmaking. And um, later on, we'll get a chance to do the, the Q&A with them. Uh, if you can just kind of hold your questions until after they're done speaking. They're each going to – we have a really great slideshow to show everyone tonight, and they're going to get through that. Then we're going to do the questions. Um, when we're doing the questions, the way that it works is you'll raise your hand. And you raise it, and there's some people will be running around with wireless microphones like this. They've got shirts on that say Insecta, and they're going to bring you the microphone. Um, when it's time for you to speak, go ahead and ask your question, and then try to help us out by giving the microphone back to them as quickly as you can so that the next person can ask the question, too. There will be two microphones. We'll do our best. Um, and uh, if you're watching this on the Internet right now through live streaming, Go ahead and start typing in your questions to the, uh, to the comment section below the live stream link or email the, the uh, email that's provided there, and we'll try to work those into the Q&A as well. So with uh, no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you, Kara, and we're going to go ahead and start with your slideshow. And I will also give you the advancer. Okay, so they tell me that down... Um, thank you, Cody, so much for that wonderful introduction. And um, I have to say that it's been an extraordinary gift to work on this project with you also. I've learned so much about 
filmmaking, I realize how much static graphics are much easier. So thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I also think I speak on behalf of the entire Department of Entomology when I say we're incredibly grateful for everything that you've made. So all the clips that are up on the channel, thank you. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to my collaborator. In, I did a science artist residency last year, and Brittany Ransom drove in today from LA and has set up some insect-filled masks that you can try on on the patio after the film is over. So you can snuggle with the bugs if we've convinced you that bugs are awesome. Um, and I also want to say thank you to all of you for coming, because it's really special for me to be able to share my love of insects with people. And it's just exciting that you were willing to come and share with me. So thank you. So let's see. We, sit, we think down. All right, OK. So um, is it possible to dim the? No? OK, so I'll just go with it. So. Um, why is it that I'm drawn to this, the insect festival, making a movie about insects? And it's because fundamentally my deepest wish is that more people on our planet understand that insects play critical roles in a healthy earth. However, most people don't really appreciate insects too much. So how would you feel if these insects were in your home? Hands up, who wouldn't like that? Yeah, so even though a lot of us are professional entomologists or enthusiasts, we don't really want to have a scorpion or a robber fly in our home. And pictured, <laughs> pictured here are some pictures from Tucson Weird, which is a Facebook group that um, people comment about um, different insects or all the things that are weird about Tucson. So I'm hoping this will advance, but maybe not. Certainly, thank you. I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay, you really got to hammer that down. So here in this Facebook group, people say things like spray first, picture second, or burn your house down. <laughs> and people may not realize, like, this is a mother scorpion brooding her young on her back. And, and spray is actually not very effective for controlling scorpions. And then on the right is a robber fly. And robber flies are good garden predators. You want them by your house. And so, as I mentioned in the film, insects are 52% of Earth's described species. And when we include the other invertebrates in orange, the, the bulk of what lives on our planet is very different from what we look like. And so this is 52% for insects is about a million described species. And for comparison, the flamingo in purple there is 10,000 described species for birds. And the mammal, as a human silhouette, is about 5,000 species, just over. So there are a lot of them, and they play really critical roles. So can anybody from these silhouettes shout out what the roles that insects might play for us? Pollination. Pollination, that's great. In the yellow? Food for wildlife, yep. Others? The others are trickier. De decomposition, like rolling dung. And as pest control, that's right, you guys are great, ringers. Um, and in a study done in 2006, which is a very conservative study because these are only the small pieces that they could get their you know, tenter hooks into research-wise, it's $67 billion per year in the US alone for these services. Again, this is a conservative estimate. And alarmingly, numbers of insects are crashing globally. And there was a recent study out of a German group that showed that total flying insect biomass has dropped dramatically. And why this is an important study is because a lot of studies look at a particular taxonomic group, and many of them are sensitive, and so we expect them to shift and change. But this is all flying insects. This is an incredible group that performs many different roles. And this study was done um, with a malaise trap Sample, maybe that loose battery in the back. Oh, there it is, waste trap sample, um, which is um, was used for the study and that we mentioned in the film. So you got to see the sorting a malaise trap sample. But can we advance it now? All right. Really? Okay. 
So, but how do we shift from burn your house down, which is a sort of standard thing, to um, if it's not necessarily everyone loving insects as much as we do, at least a greater tolerance? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to try the other one. There. No, that was backwards. Okay. I was excited because there was some motion. Um, okay, so so if not reverence, at least tolerance is what we're looking for. Um, and so what I'm going to do with this next part of the talk is go back through each of those four ecosystem services and talk about how we might shift how we think about these things. So starting with pollinators. Um, and so when we think about pollinators, we often think about honeybees. And so pictured here is a, a jar of 500 grams of honey, which requires 25,000 bee trips. And if we were going to pay bees minimum wage for that work, a jar of honey would be just over $90,000. And, and we don't pay that, do we? Right? And we wouldn't pay that. So the point is that insects are doing this silent labor for us that, that we don't appreciate. And, and Whole Foods had an incredible campaign in 2015 where they, they photographed their produce aisles with bees. And what do you think it will <laughs> And without bees, so you can see that the, the shelves are like many fewer items are there, right? No bees. But most people, when they think about um, this whole issue and, and all the campaigns that you see, um, you know, see all the branding and everything focuses on that one honeybee. And that one honeybee is, is part of a larger picture in North America of 4,000 bee species that we have. And I want to call your attention to the fact that here in the Sonoran Desert, we have many solitary bee species that are critical for pollinating our native plants. And so without those native plant fruits, we wouldn't have more native plants as food for other wildlife. Happily, though, there is a big movement around this, and so there's a lot of resources now. You can find out exactly what kind of native plants to plant in your landscape and how to provide water and shelter for these pollinators. And further, always follow the manufacturer's instruct instructions on using pesticides and never spray open blooms, because that's really critical and terrible for pollinators. So switching to insects as food, we see a variety of different vertebrates here eating insects, which is a critical part of their diet. And I want to call your attention to the fish that's eating a larval mosquito. So that's what good mosquitoes are. They're good as fish food. <laughs> Further, about 2 billion people globally have insects as part of their diet routinely. And here in, in the West, we don't quite have the same approach generally. So this lady is pointing down at what looks like a cockroach and saying, I simply cannot eat with that disgusting arthropod there. Well, she's having a fancy uh, lobster dinner, which is an arthropod. I almost said a fancy arthropod dinner. Um, and that's true. So this is a perceptual issue, right? This is a, a problem that we have in our minds. And thankfully, that's changing. So we see more and more there are... Um, Oh, hipster food trucks, right there. Um, tacos where you can get grilled crickets or other fancy sauces on tiny tacos. Um, and a lot of people come to me and they say, well, you're an entomologist. You probably don't want to ever kill insects that are in your home. And no, they're unwanted guests. And people don't have to put up with them in their home, but they also don't have to. First off, just jump out and reach for the <laughs> spray. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Because I don't know when it's going to happen either. Um, <laughs> and so, so with a few small tweaks in thinking and answering these four questions, we can really shift how we control these unwanted guests in our homes. And it's, it's quite straightforward to do. So the best part for the last, who, who's not an entomologist, recognizes what these are? Shout it out if you think you know. It looks like a roly-poly, doesn't it? That first one? Other people? Guesses? Do Domino roach? Is that what I heard? Nicely done. So these are all cockroaches. So on our planet, there are really 
only four species of the total of 4,500 described species of cockroach that are pests. But those are the ones we think of, right? We think of the American cockroach crawling out of the sink. But the vast majority of cockroaches are going about their business in forests, decomposing litter into usable energy for the nutrient cycle. So there are heroes, and many of them are beautiful. And so what can we do? How can we shift our relationship? You can leave the leaves, which turn out a shelter for pollinators. And then also, you can compost. So you can turn your trash into treasure. And that's definitely how I feel. So um, taking a step back for a bigger view, though, this is our home. We all live here together. And there are diverse people who live here and diverse other organisms. And we, I think, could really serve to embrace our neighbors more, even the really tiny ones. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Justin, who will tell us about stinging insects. Wow, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> that, that film was absolutely amazing, and it's all because of these two people here. I know this is a love fest, and I'm not supposed to be doing love fest, but this is possible because of Kara and Cody. So I think we really need to recognize that. So let's see the hands for who loves bugs. Good, good. I'm the luckiest entomologist around because I not only get to love bugs, I get to love the coolest bugs. <laughs> now I'm going to see whether I can make this thing work. There we go. First, the first thing we want to know is most stinging insects are beneficial. They're not pests. Honeybees make medi honey. You might have never heard of this. You get an ulceration or a laceration that doesn't heal. It's just yeah, yucky, and it just won't do anything, won't heal. Put all these fa fancy chemicals on it and bandages. It's not healing. Put meta honey, product of the bee. The bee was the best doctor around. They've been around for millions of years. Med honey. Of course, they make honey, which we like to eat. And we like squashes. We just had Thanksgiving and Halloween before that, squashes and pumpkins. Thank a bumblebee or thank one of the native bees that we have around here. The squash bees are actually called squash bees. Like tomatoes? Oh boy, so does that caterpillar, that, that tomato hornworm. Well, the paper wasp eats the hornworm. So they're our, bu they're our buddies. They're not pests, they're beneficial. <laughs> Getting my exercise here. <laughs> oh, I guess I managed to just turn it off. Well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> Can we manually do it from some other way? <laughs> there we go. Oh, we're back to where we were. Well, we'll try again. Hey, there we go. Stinging insects are beautiful. You say, you saw the cockroaches. They're gorgeous. But look at these. I think they match Kara's cockroaches. Absolutely spectacular. Can, any, can anybody tell me who any of those are, except for the warrior wasp? We cheated. We have the name on there. Can anyone yell out the name of one of them? Velvet Ant. Velvet Ant. Good. See, we got a good audience here. And tarantula hawk. There we go. Stinging insects can be artists. I'm not much of an artist, but I don't think I could do anywhere near as close to that. Look at that beautiful artist. She's giving us a portrait here. Sting insects can be cute and they can be adorable. See this flying teddy bear? Just so cute and adorable. You just want to hug him. And you can. He's a he. Little known fact, all the stinging ones are gals. So sorry, gals. The guys are the lovable ones in the stinging insect world. And finally, Insects, stinging insects can have good taste. This wasp, this yellow jacket, is imbibing blueberries. Blueberry wine. This was from the Amish country of Pennsylvania. This was the actual label on a, on a bottle of wine. I just couldn't resist that. 
I like the yellow jacket, like blueberries, and I like wine. And apparently, the yellow jacket's the same. <laughs> I'm not a very good Harry Potter, apparently. There we go. Yay, we did one. Okay. And stinging insects can look fierce. That fuzzy teddy bear, this is the Steve Buckman photo. Head on, looks, oh, look at this monster coming out of blue. He's just checking you out. He's looking for little girls, and he's not very bright, and he's got pretty bad vision. So he comes eyeball to eyeball with you, and he thinks, no, no, you're not a girl, so he'll just fly away. <laughs> we all love stinging insects. You say, why? It's because they are fascinating. <laughs> hey, we're on a run there. We were. <laughs> there we go. And evidence of how we're fascinated by them is these were all books or movies. The Swarm, The Killer Bees, Bowling for Columbine. Michael Moore had me feature killer bees in, the, in a segment between the two halves of his thing. I think it was kind of a failure, but anyway, killer bees sort of made, made the news. And of course, Ant-Man, anybody who's the younger ones in the audience have got to have seen this, Ant-Man, the Marvel film. Yay, a couple of them. My favorite is the National Geographic, Hornets from Hell. You say, well, this is just scary, you know, the... Hey, we got it. I think Gary Larson says it's better than any of the rest of us ever could. One picture is worth a million words in this case. And you say, well, this is just cartoons in real life. You know, we're not really that way. We're better than that. So we'll. Oh, sorry. The action suddenly stopped while both sides waited patiently for the hornet to calm down. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I usually don't read it because. It's higher up and everybody can see it. So the one time that I don't read it is when it doesn't work. Oh. There we go. I don't know what I did, but did Justin do that? I think I messed it out of focus. Well, <laughs> there we go. So here's, a, here's another real life example. This is from the second. Battle of Bull Run, the American Civil War. And this was from a diary of one of the soldiers. And he said, Confederate bullets had not been able to unseat the Yankees from their positions, but a few dozen riled bees did. In an instant, the men were put to flight by the furious insects, one regular wrote. The panic was contagious. In a twinkling, every position was abandoned, and every man was fleeing from unknown danger. So here it was, I'm, I'm in this foxhole. I'm kind of looking up, and cannons are firing over, and I'm kind of looking up and saying, no, I don't think I'm going to stay in here. I'm going to duck down a little bit more. Bee stings me in the posture. Whoa! <laughs> I'm out of here. Next thing I know, I got a chunk of shrapnel through my skull. So I submit that the stinging insects won. Oh, somehow they... OK, well, good. I think this encapsulates it. We got it to move, so I'm not going to go back. It might not. <laughs> this was a fortune cookie I got in Pretoria, South Africa, when I was studying African bees, that, where the Africanized bees came from. We were trying to learn you know, a little bit about their biology and that sort of thing. And I thought this fortune cookie said it all in seven words. Honey is sweet, but the bee stings. We have this dichotomy. We have these yin and yang. We love honey. We love bees. But oh, they sting. So how do we measure sting pain? Oh, I shouldn't have made these complicated slides. <laughs> Wish I just had it all in one slide. <laughs> well, anyway, it's supposed to be giving. There we go. Why with a pain scale, of course. <laughs> and it's in a scale of one to four. So I'll just give you a sampling of what they are. Oh, audience, can you recognize any of these? The honeybee in the top's too easy to get something else. 
Tarantula hawk, bumblebee. Yeah, we have yellow jacket. What about the big one in the middle? Velvet ant, good. That's a Jillian Coles photo. Magnificent picture. That thing is an eighth of an inch long, just to show you don't have to have big insects to be beautiful. Ah, oh, fire ant. Sharp, suddenly, mildly alarming, like walking across a shag carpet and reaching for the light switch. <laughs> Pain level one. Not too bad, you can endure that. Honeybee. Burning, corrosive, a flaming match head lands on your arm. Pain level two. Ooh, no, we're getting serious here. That's, that's pretty bad. Harvest rant, bold and unrelenting. Somebody's using a power drill to excavate your ingrown toenail. Pain level three. You don't want to go there. We'll finally get to the grand, grandmama, all of them. Tarantula hawk, blinding, fierce, shockingly electric. A running hair dryer has been dropped into your bubble bath. <laughs> Pain level four. So with that, for more stories, poetry, insect safari, why insects sting, read my book. It's on sale out in the back. It's much more interesting than me, I can assure you that. And with that, if we can get this to... We'll turn it over to our, my distinguished colleague, Wendy Moore. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Um, there's a lot of firsts for me here tonight. I never thought I'd follow Justin speaking, and I never thought I'd be at the loft uh, talking about falling in love with my husband <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> but here we are. Um, so uh, most of you guys are residents here in southern Arizona, and you probably have your own intimate insect stories. Um, hopefully yours aren't as explosive as mine or as painful as Justin's. But we... Um, sh <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> hip, hip, hooray! <laughs> Okay. Oh, you know, you already know where we live. We live in an amazing place. So the Sonoran Desert region, ooh, oh, thanks, <laughs> is um, one of 35 conservation, um, right, hot spots recognized by Conservation International. It's kind of amazing we get to live here. And um, we share this region with an incredible diversity of arthropods including some larval butterflies, some big Palo Verde beetles. We usually notice these guys because they come out during the monsoon season and they're so outrageous. Um, some of the insects that are finding you, you've seen a lot of this one tonight. And some big, beautiful, large-bodied species um, some that come out in the monsoon season in high numbers. But in fact, most of the species that live here in the Sonoran Desert are really small, like smaller than the grain, a grain of rice. And so um, the diversity is really outstanding, and, and it often goes unnoticed. And a lot of them are really important. So in addition to our critically important pollinators, we also have some painful insects and some insects that transmit disease. Ah, <laughs> I'm getting good. So um, the economic impacts of insect pests are estimated at nearly $33 billion annually, just in the United States alone and that's due to crop losses and mitigation effects. Some of them can de devastate large parts of our country, like the bark beetles are dev devastating our forests. So given that they're so diverse and so small and so important, how is it that we can identify any one insect specimen and know whether it's a friend or a foe? 
the best way to do this is to compare that specimen to a specimen that's already been identified by an expert. <laughs> oh, uh, ideal. Ah, uh, maybe when I do that, you could work with me. <laughs> it's a good sign. <laughs> so, um, what we need are species names. The species name is actually, whoop, one more forward, the critical link between the insect specimen and all of the published information that we have on it. And um, it is with that species name that we can develop a meaningful plan of action for how we, how we deal with that, with, that, with that specimen. So as the curator of the University of Arizona Insect Collection, I'd like to welcome you to our reference library for how we identify insect pests and good, good insects in, in this region. So we're located on the fourth floor of the Forbes building near the center of the University of Arizona's campus. And um, right on that fourth floor, we have, this is right above the dean's head, <laughs> we have two million insect specimens. And most of them are identified to the species level. And those specimens have been identified by specialists. There are 35,000 insect names that are attached to those specimens. So this is an incredible resource for identifying the insects of our region. Our collection is the collection of insects for the Sonoran Desert region. We don't have a Smithsonian institution or a field museum here. We, this is in a university collection. And so it is the most important for the Sonoran Desert region. And this reference library, it's not what you normally see as a reference library. It's not filled with books and journals, but instead it's filled with compound eyes. They're not working with me. Um, antennae and legs and mandibles. It's filled with them, two million of them, sets of them. And it's also filled with tiny labels it has all the details on where and when a specimen was collected and, um, uh, and when. And so this is a beetle that was collected in 1975 from the Rosemont mine site in the Santa Rita Mountains. <laughs> so thanks to recent investments, both by the Science Foundation, National Science Foundation and also the College for Agriculture and Life Sciences, our collection is housed in state-of-the-art modern compactor-based facilities that protect those two million specimens in only 440 square feet. <coughs> Swoosh. Okay. Within each cabinet, um, each cabinet is filled with drawers and each drawer is filled with insect specimens. And some of those specimens can be like hundreds of years old. So fortunately, insect specimens are very resilient to change over time. And well-curated specimens can look much like they did the day they were collected. Most of our specimens are smaller than the head of a pen. But each one of them has been labeled carefully and identified to the species level in most cases. So um, just last year, there was a new um, pest that was discovered in Arizona for the first time. This was the sugarcane aphid. So um, it was in 2016, this pest was collected from sorghum fields in Pinal County. Specimens were sent to the UAIC, and they were identified as the sugarcane aphid by Gene Hall, who's the collection manager in the collection. And one month later, within one month, the EPA granted farmers a Section 18 emergency exemption to use a dangerous pesticide against an even more dangerous insect. So we were able to move quickly to really control a, a really invasive pest. But this is actually the exception to the rule. So most often, 
we receive insects that um, other people think are a problem, and they're wrong. And so we can identify them as a friend rather than a foe and save the world from unneeded pesticide use. But collections are more than references for identification. They have a wide variety of uses, and two of the most important of which is that they can allow us to attract attract uh, change, environmental change over time. And they will, they're also storehouses of genetic information. So in the UAIC, we're using modern bioinformatic techniques to disseminate our specimen level uh, associated data freely and quickly on the internet as we build a biodiversity atlas of the Sonoran Desert region. This is gonna help us to track ranges, um, expanding or contracting. It'll help us um, look for new pests coming into the state or immigration of species across the U.S.-Mexico border. And as I mentioned in the film, um, it's also really exciting for us that uh, new sequencing technology is allowing us to sequence this, the DNA that are inside these specimens and will allow naturalist museums to participate in the genomic age for the first time. Thanks to generous support from a private foundation, the Schlinger Foundation, we recently built a um, designated clean room for DNA extraction, an ancient DNA lab within the footprint of the collection, which will allow us to get genomic data from even our oldest specimens. We are the first university collection in the country to have one. Yeah, thanks. It's actually a great hope for natural history museums around the world because they're all suffering from a severe lack of funding. And I think that this uh, next generation sequen sequencing technology is going to be really helpful for revitalizing the recognition of the importance of natural history collections. So specimens, the physical specimens are irreplaceable. They are the physical um, product, a real product of evolution. And they're amazingly intricate at, at every level. And so this SEM is um, a photo of a mosquito foot, one mosquito foot. And that's just one example. Yeah, they're amazingly compl complex. Museum collections are also sometimes the only place you find representatives of any species. And so this is kind of an unfortunate story <laughs> because um, the UAIC, we have 10 uh, specimens of this water beetle that was declared extinct last year by the Fish and Wildlife Service that lived in Madera Canyon. Um, and they really are um, time machines. And they're not only time machines for themselves, but they harbor hidden diversity. So they harbor um, parasites, they harbor endosymbionts, even pollen. So this is a pollen on a bee. And we can use all of those things for very many different studies. And we really have no idea what kind of technologies are going to come down the line. What are, what's going to be developed in the future, but we're going to be right here. And we can greet those technologies and use them and work in ways to protect our biodiversity. So we welcome you to come visit us. We are located in, on, in, on the, in the Forbes building um, in the center of campus. We would love for you to come and visit us. We're not really a display-based museum, but we do have a few exhibits for visitors. And um, we'd be happy to give you a tour, which we give to school groups and visitors all of the time. Um, and we would be happy to tell you how we are striving to <laughs> ensure a safe and sustainable future by discovering and archiving insect biodiversity in the Sonoran Desert region. Thank you.
Oh, is it oh. more? Lots of swoops on this one. I was? Oh. <laughs> yeah, you swoop. <laughs> Kara's got better technique than I have, so I'm going to have her to. <laughs> Next slide. So if you can just animate the rest of the slide just till it's finished, and then I'm going to. Um, so I think uh, I have a lot better understanding of the importance of uh, what these three scientists do up here, and I think hopefully everyone else does as well. So if we can just give them one round of applause just for doing a great job. Especially people who are willing to sting themselves with tarantula hawks. That's just, that's a tough way to make a living, I think. Um, all right, this is the part of the program where we, we're going to open it up to questions from the, from the audience and from our online audience. Um, so do you guys have your microphones? OK. Hello. Okay, so what? just remember, if you have a question, raise your hand. They're going to bring you a microphone. So it looks like we have our first question. Hi. Go ahead. Do you want standing or sitting? If, okay. If, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to stand, that, that would be great, and just um, address it one of the It will make a difference. So, <laughs> stand up, stand up. so uh, I feel like we're in the midst of a, an experiment uh, we human species with this earth, and that is um, an uncontrolled experiment. Uh, we're constantly putting new chemicals out into our air, food, and water, and and pulling out the sprays and such. And you know, I kind of jump through the hoops in my own personal life to use fly predators and and um, other solutions. Like I make my own termite traps, and and they work. And you know, it's like you don't have to be spraying all these unbelievably carcinogenic chemicals out in the environment. So my question to you, all of you as a panel, is uh, you know, you're, you're in the field of entomology. Can you tell us what do the insects have to teach us about how we can move forward f uh, towards saving this Mother Earth? Let's keep it clean. That was really interesting. Have I got enough cord? Could you, does that work? Yeah, so what can insects teach us to live on our Earth in a, a more sustainable way? And I think that, um, for me, that answer is one of collaboration. I think, I think that uh, we're in a time where we're seeing collaboration is not as strong as it has been in our human history. And insects collaborate in incredible ways. And they demote the individual for the benefit of the group. And so I think that we could learn something from that culturally, where we put ourselves behind and support support what is the greater good in front of us. I'll follow up too with that. Um, so I work on bombardier beetles. They are incredibly, they're masters of chemistry, but they're reluctant to use it, right? And I think that if we have, we, we need tools to be able to protect ourselves and that we have to be really mindful about how we use it. And so I think we can learn from them in that way as well. Yeah, I think another thing we can do is turn the equation around and look at us, our side of the picture, that often the problem is if we look through the insect's eyes, we'll learn that they're not really a problem, it's how we react to them is the problem. So I think learning a love of insects, put yourself in the insect's position. That cockroach doesn't want to hurt you, it's just scuttling across the floor, it's hungry. Throw it outside or feed it to the neighbor's cat or whatever. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to spray it. And I think, I think if we can down-regulate our intolerance, in other words, become more tolerant, that will be a big start to helping the pro solve the problem. Hi. This last 10 years of this aw awful drought has been breaking my heart. Used to be you could turn on the back porch light and all of a sudden, you were in the middle of a great knot of life, you know, including all the creatures that came to eat the insects. Does, is there any hope that 
things will get better soon? I think so. I think there's hope. Um, I think that I, when I first moved here to Tucson as an entomologist, everyone told me, you're going to see a lot of things happening at one time, and then you may not see that species. They may come out in great numbers. You may not see them for a, a couple of years. And so I think that um, I think we need an El Nino year and more rain. Um, but I think, that, I think that they're very resilient and that they will come back when, when the conditions are are right. Yeah, I, I think another way we can look at it is to cherish the good times. Like I've been here 37 years. I sort of hate to admit that. Been here a long time. This summer was magical. We had double the rain that we've ever had any of the time that I've been here. And it just looked like I was in the middle of the Amazon, except the trees were a little bit smaller. Everything was so green. It was just so magnificent. And I think if we celebrate the unusual events like Wendy mentioned, Things will happen. Maybe I'll have to wait another 37 years. I hope not. But I, I think you know, if we, if we turn it around and, and be positive, because negative is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, could you all comment on the pros and cons of uh, the possibility of DNA engineering of insects to create hybrid species or new species for our own use or just for fun. <laughs> wow. I, I, I'm, I'm the oldest, so I guess I can take the most risk of anybody. I, I think it's a great idea in certain situations. For example, rescuing an endangered species might be one situation that's not very charismatic, perhaps. But more practical, think about mosquitoes. They kill millions of people every year. We can engineer a mosquito so that it kills the trypanosome parasite or the plasmodium, rather, I work on trypanosomes, so I get them interchanged. Anyway, the parasite of malaria, then I think that would be a great benefit. And the mosquito, like we said, it's just fish food. It's fish food that happens to have this bad side effect that, it, that it's adult to its parasites kills us. And if we could genetically program these things to get rid of that, I think it's worth it in special cases. I'm not saying just every time you turn it around, do it. You know, do a lot of thinking, a lot of ethics involved here, but I think it shouldn't be a closed door. Could, could you tell us about that charismatic insect that's going to be famous because it's on the poster and the, all the logos for the movie? Yeah, so that's a longhorn beetle photograph taken by John Sarton. John, where are you? All the way at the back, nice. Thank you so much, John. John is foraying out into insect photography, and I hope this encourages him to continue. So I, I named that Darth Beetle, which is kind of. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Star Wars fan. So. I find it so tragic to think that this collection that you've said is so very special, you know, can't exist in more places and that that can't be sort of co-joined with um, maybe, maybe it's a key to changing uh, the attitude that we have towards insects. Um, but one of the things that I've been trying to figure out as I've formed this question is, is how, how do you get um, curriculums from very early childhood education, how do you get them out of these stagnant grasp of, you know, earth science that just seems to be about dirt and stars and start you including um, going out in the field and starting a school uh, program to collect insects and build a program, you know, a, a collection we within each school. Is that grant money? How do you change people to open up those possibilities? Oh boy, that's a good one. So I think, yes, <laughs> grant money, um, donations. What, one of the things that I'm really passionate about are getting um, kids to make their own insect collection and to have a good microscope where they can see for themselves what it is they're collecting. And then if they can do that in the context of a collection space so that they can then multiply that two million times, they can grasp the significance of the collection 
and insects and entomology. And so I think um, one of my one of the things that I would like to do the most is to get as many students as I can into that collection to get to get that hook. And cross globally, that would have so many amazing possibilities of kids swapping collections. You are not my plant. <laughs> Just so easy. But also, so another thing that I really want to do is develop an on, this is new for most people in the room to hear probably, but I want to develop an online field course, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it would, for that reason, because you can connect globally the excitement of the field and the excitement. You can share under a microscope what it is that we see and we can share it on the internet. And, and I think it could go, it could really help. Seems like it's possible. I think it is, I think it's <laughs> very possible. It's a lot of energy. Can I add something, actually, Justin? All right. Yeah. Actually, can I just add one quick thing, which is that we have here actually a program called Insect Discovery Outreach Program run by Dr. Kathleen Walker. And she reaches about 3,500 school children in Tucson annually. And she has a website, insectdiscovery.org, and you can download curricula. But it is live insects and, and, and science and math with insects but on the way to learning about the beauty of collections. Yeah, I think another thing we can add to that is it's not complicated. It doesn't take much money. You can get grade one kindergarten, grade two or three. You can go out in the local playground if there's grass or some kind of plants, you can find insects. I remember one of the best places to go is, believe it or not, the cemeteries. Cemeteries are wonderful <laughs> locations for finding insects. They're, they're diverse, they have a lot of different plants, and they kind of have this mystique which adds a kind of an element of, of fun for the kids. Kind of like I said with stinging insects, it's a little bit of this mystique and fear. Well, that's, that's a good learning tool, and so, we, we don't need fancy equipment. You know, it's nice to have that, but we can start right off with the, the youngest kids, and then maybe by the time they get a little older, get them a, a microscope and in biology class, what Wendy was talking about. So I think we can do it. All right, uh, this question is, my, my daughter Charlotte would like to know something. Um. How old were you when you first started loving bugs? I think I was as soon as I could crawl. I don't really remember. I think before memory I was in the backyard. Well, bugs, earthworms, if you count those as bugs, but for me it started really early. I was, I'm trying to calculate it. I can't say exactly, but I think I was like 25 or 24 because I loved another group of arthropods. And I, when I moved into the terrestrial world out of the marine biology, I missed them so much. I didn't get these bugs at all. But after going to the California Academy of Sciences and looking at them, looking at them one after another, I fell in love and I never looked back. I remember the exact moment that I fell in love with insects. I was. I think 14 years old, and I brought a dead gopher skull home to my mother. I have two older brothers, and she said, what are you doing? I said, look, mom, look at these beetles crawling in and out of the eye holes. They, they have orange pom-pom antennae. Like, what, and I didn't know the word antennae at that point, but I, I just was like, this is fabulous. And so I just think there's this incredible diversity in insects that's easy to be, to be bitten by that bug. <laughs> well, Cody, when did you? It's never too late, and I found out <laughs> making this documentary that bugs are pretty interesting. <laughs> do any of you, oh, that's loud. Do any of you study insect behavior? And if so, uh, how does insect problem solving, I guess, compare to that of arachnids or other invertebrates like um, centipedes and millipedes? The insect behaviorist is in the row behind you. <laughs> Not directly, but. Um, Dan Pappage. There he is. <laughs> Dan, nice. Dan Pappage from the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. Would you like to answer that question?
So to repeat what Dan Pabich has just said is that insects across the board, beyond just bees, are incredibly clever and, and capable of learning complicated tasks. So it's across all insects. Okay, I'm going to bring one in from online, okay. and this one's for Justin. And it's how the heck do you endure the stings? Well, it, it's one of these things that when you're in the thick of the battle, you don't really think about what's going on. You just if you have passion and you have dedication and you have se sense of adventure, just what comes with the adventure. And so I don't really endure it. You know, I certainly wouldn't. Say, oh, today I'm going to go out and get myself stung. I have great admiration for Coyote Peterson. There's no way I could have done a tarantula hawk like he did. Mm -hmm. I got stung by the tarantula hawk by being greedy. <laughs> I got six of them in my net. I didn't want any of them to get out. Ever tried getting six of those into one small jar? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, I went from this girl Oops. five years ago who was afraid of moths and screamed and ran away to this um, person that doesn't want to see him get hurt or injured or whatever. So I just wanted to know, um, when you collect the insects, do you, um, are they dead, or are they alive, or do you kill them? Like, how do you collect them? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I started out as an avid collector to begin with, and then I thought, wait, what am I doing? I love these things, and um, I thought that I need to treat them with a lot more respect and care, and so um, generally when most entomologists collect insects, they use either a, a, a jar that's filled with a kind of gas that slowly brings them to sleep, uh, or uh, people put them in the freezer, and so it's sort of equivalent. It just slowly brings them their nervous system just shuts down. And so, as far as we know, they're not experiencing pain the way that we would describe it, so. We also um, take a really, we take it really seriously. The responsibility, if we're gonna collect an insect, I mean, for me and the members of my lab and the people that I've collected with, the, it's for science. And if it's not for science, we don't collect them. I can just give you an example of my own life. Harvest Harvesterance, the three that had the, the drilling in your toenail, remember those guys? Yeah. Well, I collect those because I, I show them to a lot of classes and various things of this sort. I go out and I catch them in the morning. I show them and put them in nice sand and give them a little bit of water, try to make life as nice as possible in their little jail that they're in. And then at the end of the day, I take them and put them back in their colony. So you don't always have to. Now, I've killed a lot of them, which I had to in order to do the ex research experiment on them. But when I was doing the you know, outreach and showing them, you can, you can let them go. So in that case, you know, just how, how important is it that you have, have to dispatch the animal? And usually, if you think about it, it's not as often as you think. And we have time for just one more question, unfortunately. So. I'm not sure who that is, but her question is real similar. They said I, are are there plans? I, I would binge watch six seasons of this. <laughs> <laughs> are there plans to do more? That's my question. <laughs> on the on the filmmaking aspect? Yeah. Are you asking yeah. about the filmmaking aspect? Yeah. Uh, there, there are no plans to do any any follow up at this time. So right now, it's it's been we're poorly funded, and we we've, we've organized it to do a, a big push right now. But you know, I really enjoy doing it, and I would binge watch six seasons too. So <laughs> maybe we can <laughs> come up. Yeah. So I guess the answer to that is probably what Kara's saying, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it's how we can you know support programs like this and it's going to really comes down to funding so we have limited resources and limited time and my obligations uh, work for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences is that I'll, I'll probably move on to other important science but I would love I would love to come back um, for a sequel so uh, we have one one more question I think over here yeah well I, I would like a calibration without the echo so much uh, I've been stung by bees most of us have 
Yellow Jackets, yes. Not, not, not a whole lot of fun with either of those. So far, I've skipped over the tarantula wasp and got a stingray. And I thought that if I was a woman, and if I knew that birth pains were like that, there would be no human population left giving birth. <laughs> so I just wonder, what's the calibration would you think for stingray on this scale you have? Unfortunately, I have to punt on that because I've never actually been stung by one. But I have been secondarily related. My, my previous wife was stepped on one down in, in Mexico. And I'll tell you, she was screaming so much that we, her dad and I had to leave the camper and sleep out on the beach because <laughs> <laughs> we, we gave her a bunch of pain medication, which I'm not going to mention what they are because they probably weren't legal. But anyway, <laughs> we got her through the night, and the next morning she was just fine. So I would suspect I wouldn't be surprised if there were, if there were winged, wings on it and it flew and lived in a colony in a nest like a wasp, it, it would probably be a five. But that's just a guess. Okay. One more question. Um, my question is simple, right here. They keep talking about how all bees are Africanized now, and they keep showing on TV all these um, terrible little clips on the news about bees attacking. And Is that true? Are all bees Africanized now, or is that just fake news? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's not fake news. The, the only domestic, or you can call them European bees, I like to call them domestic because they live in white boxes or beekeepers' boxes. Those are the only ones that exist in southern Arizona in the Sonoran Desert area. And there's so few of those because there's so few beekeepers anymore, it's just too difficult to keep the bees. And if you used to have them in the city, you know, neighbors would say, oh, wonderful, I love the bees next door. And you give the beekeeper would give them your jar of honey and everything was fine. Bees next door, you can't have them there, get them out of here. And so the beekeepers have been pretty much driven to the hinterlands. And so the few domestic bees that we have are way far away from town. And so you, you just won't see them at all Africanized. So I think we're at the part of the evening where we're running out of time, um, but we are, all of us will be out on the patio out there, and so I hope we can kind of continue the conversation with you out there. Um, also, a uh, few other little things, you're going to notice some people with black insecta shirts on. Um, we really encourage you to go up and ask them a question about insects. And if you feel like the answer that you're getting has, is really not a very good answer, then ask them a question about filmmaking, because that, they're probably on the filmmaking crew in that case. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, a lot of this is really important. A lot of people are probably wondering, you know, what can you do? What, what can I do? What can you do? And we've tried to make that easy. So, what you want to do is go to the website, which is www.insectamovie.org. You're going to find the complete documentary that you saw there. It's very easy to share it. There's just a little button in the top right corner, a little arrow thing. Just click that. You can share it with whoever you want. You can connect with us on social media and, and share it that way. Um, share it with everyone you know. And if you know people who don't like bugs, then you're probably going to have to share it with them at least twice. <laughs> so um, that's important. Also on the website is a Get Stung button. Click that. You're going to go to a page. You're going to learn all about the, the really great courses that are being offered by the UA Entomology Group, um, just all kinds of fascinating stuff to learn. Um, and then you can find out how to contribute to the various programs, and they're all listed there, and you can pick which one that's interesting. Maybe you have a rich cousin, just send that to them. Um, and of course, you can also support um, film filmmaking like what we're doing tonight, and, uh, and maybe we'll get a six-part series, six part series out of it. So please do that. And you know, I just want to leave everybody with one kind of final thought. And that's that, you know, tonight um, you saw the film, you got a chance to hear the scientists here, and what does it all mean? And what it really is, is it's our, consider it our invitation to, you know, become fascinated with something that's maybe bigger, or in this case, maybe smaller. And it's really fun to connect with your passion, and it's okay to let your special side out because that's going to shape our community and it's going to shape our future. So thank you. Thank you all for coming.